this is the night that I've been dreading. It's the last night. At least for me, at least for now. And I can't tell you, I feel like a fifth grader leaving church camp for the first time and wondering if you'll ever see your friends again and being determined you're going to remember everything God did as best you can. Hoping that it won't be long before you can see one another, either here, there, or in the air, as they say. I feel a certain pressure, not from you, but I feel a certain, there has to be a better word than pressure, but that's all I can think of right now. I have a desire, a special desire, to give you the very best that I can in a way that makes sense and can get down in there and, and stick with you long after long after today is tonight's done. I know unless God does it, nothing gets done without God. Uh, We may think it does sometimes, but but it doesn't. Nothing lasting. Everything without God is just a, a flick and a wisp and it's gone. And it is no more. But if God is God and if we surrender to him, what he, what he might do in our hearts tonight will last as, as long as we last and beyond. So I'm going to pray a second. If you don't mind, join me if you would, Jesus. Tonight, Lord, it's not about them. It's not about me. It's about you and God. You deserve a people that love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. You, de- you deserve a people that delight in you so much that whether they are blessed or tested, they don't care because they just love you and they're just thankful to have your name written on their hands and they're just thankful to have a new heart and not that old stony heart they once had. God, I pray that you'd fill us up with the hope and a joy and a peace and a rest that can only be found in you. And God, I pray that tonight the reviving work that you've begun in lives, and I know you have because I'm hearing the stories one person at a time. But God, I pray that you'll kick it up a notch, as Emeril Lagasse might say. And God, I pray it'd just flow all over this place. God, I pray that our cups would overflow, everyone. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us to the point that we just lose the desire for everything there is except finding and following and, and serving and loving you. And Lord, we commit to you, Lord. You know we're limited and weak and needy, but God, all the things that we are not, you are. And so we're looking to your strength tonight, and we're believing, Lord, for eternal changes in hearts and and that you'll be glorified. And we're going to give you the thanks and the praise by faith right now. In your name, Jesus, our soon-coming King, amen. Amen. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you to kind of lay the groundwork, if we could. And now that I know you can bring them up, I'm going to give them to you and and uh, let you bring them up. If you got your Bible, I think it's good practice just to, you know, find where things are and find it before he can and bring it up even maybe. Psalm 101. Would you turn there if you can? And if you don't, well, we'll look at it on the screen. Psalm, Psalm 101. This is the first thing I had on my heart today when I woke up. This is what I was thinking about. David wrote these words, and it says, I will sing of, I'm starting verse 1, I will sing of loving kindness and justice to thee, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will thou come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. The thing that always stirs me about this, it's all stirring, but the thing that just speaks to me down deep at the core of everything I am and at the core of everything God wants to make in me, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. 
I love all the times he says, I will. I will sing of the loving kindness and justice to thee, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will not set any worthless thing before my eyes. I love it that God gives us a will, that God gives us the choice. The reason that we're revived or not revived is not because God wants us revived or doesn't want us revived. It's because we want to be revived or we don't want to be revived. I've never met anybody that really wanted to be revived that wasn't revived because revival is something you can cultivate. Now, he can drop it on you, and if he drops it on you, then that's wonderful. But if, you, but if he doesn't drop it on you, I believe you can prepare your heart in such a way that at some point he's just going to have to give it to you because it seems like you're not going to be happy until you have it and you're not going to give up until you have it. What are you talking about? I'm talking about setting your mind on God. I will not set my mind on worthless things. I will set my mind on God. I will love the Lord my God with all my heart and mind, soul and strength. And I will, by the grace of God, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I'm a, I, I was uh, in college during Vietnam. And, and some of you know what I'm talking about. And I remember, I remember on the news, you seeing men all shot to the dickens. And they're crawling up and they're trying to get to an opening. Because they know if they can get to an opening, that big whirly bird can come down and help them. But they know until they get to that opening, that bird can't get to them. And so men would crawl as though their life depended on it because their life did depend on it. And other men would grab them and drag them as though their life depended on it because their life did depend on it. Because they knew there was a place where help would come. And they knew if they didn't get to that place, help would not come. I think that's what David had in him. I think it was that warrior mentality where he says, I will, I will serve God. I will seek God. I will walk with God in the integrity of my heart. I believe when God finds that we've given him a landing strip like that in our lives, I believe he's going to come. I don't believe you've got to beat him up and beg and cut yourself and do all kinds of things to get his attention. The Bible says that God by his Holy Spirit is circling the earth right now trying to find somebody whose heart is perfect towards him. Why? Because he wants to make a landing. He's going to land in your life. You don't have to beg and plead and do some strange thing. Just say, by the grace of God, I want God in my life. I want God in my heart. I want to walk with God. I want the integrity of God. When people see me, I don't care if they remember me. I don't care if they remember my name. But I pray that the anointing will touch them and help them and strengthen them and get on them and empower them. And it will spread from them everywhere they go. And I believe with all of my heart we could have revival because we say, I will not rest until I am revived. Tonight, this music was such a blessing to me. I was just sitting there, and my cup was just running over. And then Brother Don said, somebody, their cup running over. And I said, in my heart and my spirit, I said, amen, brother. I'm hooked to you. Wherever God is, that's where I want to be hooked to. Whoever God's on at the moment, that's who I want to be hooked to. Whatever's anointed at the moment, that's what I want to buy into. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's, I don't care where it is or who it is or what it is. If God is anointing it, then I want to come and I want to drink it. I want to eat it. I want to bathe in it. I want to surround myself in it. I want to be anointed with it. I want to walk in it. And I don't want anything but the anointing and the help and the peace of Almighty God. I've got another verse for you to look at. First Timothy, First Timothy, Thessalonians Timothy, I found it myself, 1, 5. I don't know what I wrote down, but I don't think that's what I wanted. <laughs> I'm sorry. You said that lately? Yeah, I did today. I had to tell pastor. I said, pastor, I'm sorry. 
I overstepped my bounds. I did something. I said, I recognize it after I did it. It's too late to change it then, but I'm telling you now, I'm sorry. Am I telling you the truth? I said, I, I said, I'm, I said, I'm sorry. I'm going to say I'm sorry to one of you tonight. There was a senior in the, in the meeting, you know, when we had the thing, eating, singing, had so much fun. There was, a, there was a senior in that meeting, and I said something, and I caused one senior a little bit of shock. Now, I said the truth. I spoke the truth, but I didn't give it enough background. It was just like a one blast, and they went, whoa, and I saw I unsettled them, and I couldn't do anything now. Then, at least I didn't think I could, but late, later on, I got so... I got so convicted, I thought, dear God, I wouldn't want to cause, I wouldn't want to cause anybody distress. And I quoted Psalm 78, 34, when he killed them, then he sought him. And if that person's here tonight, I want you to know I'm going to tell you a little bit about it so it wasn't a single blast. The Bible's talking about, the, the, the psalmist is, is saying, isn't it a shame that the people of God have to have calamity to get their attention? You can almost turn to any page in the Old Testament and find that, find that very thing happen. In fact, when I was first saved, I remember reading the Scriptures, and there was one time where the people came to God and left Him, came to God and left Him, came to God and left Him before I turned the page. It's a common theme. And the truth of it is, a lot of times we don't come to God until there's some tragedy and still there's some difficulty. And so if I had set that up, that senior could have said amen. But because I hit it and flew past, they went, whoa, what was that? And so I didn't want to do that to you, and so I, I want to apologize to, to you. Paul said, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sin Seer faith. The goal of our instruction, he said, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In 2 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul said this, that he ministers with a clear conscience. You want to look that up? Let's try it again. 2 Corinthians that was probably 2 Timothy I wanted, and I thought it was 1 Timothy. But let's go on. 2, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1.12. Paul is writing to a church, and they have just, uh, they, they got more troubles than Quakers got oats. They really do. I mean, they got together for communion, for goodness sakes, and it was a drunken thing. And In fact, God was so grieved that Paul said that God caused some of the people to fall asleep early. That was a gentle way of saying that God took them out because, because they, they, so, they so dishonored God. 2 Corinthians 1, 12, look at this. For our, now Paul's writing, for our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, and I hope you will understand until the end. Paul is telling them that while he was with them, he maintained a clear conscience. He said to them only what he was instructed to say to them. And for Paul, walking with clean hands and a pure heart, a clear conscience was essential. King David was the same thing when he said, I'm going to walk with God in the integrity of my heart. Paul meant the same thing when he wrote to his son in the gospel. And he said, our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Psalm 139, 23 is the fourth one I wanted you to look at. And, and David wrote this, and you know this one. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Maybe you're like me and you memorized that in King James. And he said, search me and try me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way within me. The point of all these scriptures, the reason I shared them is because whatever I've shared with you this week, Whatever I've shared with you this week, 
This is, the, this is ground zero. This is the level. This is the base. This is the foundation to come to God with an earnest and a sincere heart and a clear conscience. You've said the I'm sorry's that you need to say. You've repented of the things you needed to repent to. You're coming to God with the blood of Jesus having washed your robe white. And you've come before him and you're ready to be used by God however God wants to use you. You need to understand, and I know you do, God can't use you until you come to him in that way. God can't use you. Until you come to God and ask God to wash, to be washed with the word of God, to be sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, that to God would give you a clean hands and a pure heart, a clear conscience that you can be connected with him because he is a holy God. And if you're going to be connected to him, you've got to be holy. There's no other choice about that. People get all mixed up and they say, well, I'm just going to live the way I live and God will come to me. God will bend down and reach down to you in the miry clay but his idea is to bring you out of the miry clay and put your feet on the rock to stay amen you can't ask God to come down and live in the muck and the mire with you because you won't let him lift you up that doesn't make sense if you're dealing with a habit, if you're dealing with a difficulty, don't think that God's will is for you to live in that habit or live in that difficulty. It's not God's will. God, if, if he's making you a new creature, then he wants you to be born again, and he didn't make you a new creature and then attach the old habits. It doesn't work that way. And so when you are born again and you surrender to God, maybe you were born again 30 years ago. But you come back to God and you say, God, you're not alive in my heart like you once were. Restore me back, Lord, to my first love. God, help me to see if I've turned from you in any way. Is there anybody I've offended, God? I pray, God, that you come now and cleanse me. Shine the light of the Holy Ghost in my life. And if there's anything there that needs to be dealt with, then God, help me to see it. Give me the strength and the will and the courage to lift whatever that is to you and say, God, come and cleanse me and purify me because you've got work to do, God. And I don't want to be a good-for-nothing Christian stuck on the sideline. I want to be back in the middle of the fray. Renew me, restore me, refresh me, empower me, God. I'm asking you now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask for anything else, God, until I have it, until it is mine. Oh, God, you seek God with a heart like that. You're going to get it. God is going to give it to you. Even if God didn't want to give it to you, the Bible says clearly that he will give it to you if you just keep asking. You remember the story about the judge? Woman went not talking about the judge, trying to get the judge. Judge was unrighteous judge. Just really wished she'd just go away. But when they told the story, they said, finally, the, finally the judge said, okay, I'm going to give it to you just because you're wearing me out with the asking. That seek and you shall find knocking you and the door shall be open asking you shall be given. It's something you want to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. Listen, the holiness of God, the power and the zeal of God, may I just say it clear this way, don't leave home without it. That's one of the reasons I am confident that God gets me up early in the morning because I can take a shower in maybe 15 minutes or so. But lots of times the shower I need from God maybe takes me an hour or two sometimes. See, you see somebody with the joy of the Lord and you go, oh yeah, they're just that way. Or you see somebody happy at 7 a.m., you think that's just because they're a morning person. Let me tell you something. That morning person stuff, don't get me started. I don't think there is such a thing. A morning person is a regular person with the joy of the Lord in the morning. Amen? Amen. Now you say, Pastor Mike, I bet you just wake up that way. Well, you'd be wrong. <laughs> you'd be wrong. There's days I get up and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, it's not even light yet. You got me up. I go in and stumble around, get my coffee going, put it in my big trucker's cup, and get that thing microwaved. 
I go back down. I sit in the back room in my chair and it's all dark. And I say, God, I thank you that I've got hands at work and I've got feet at work. I thank you, God, that you're in my heart. You're in my life. I'm thankful, God, in 1983 on Good Friday, you came and saved my soul. And now you've given me a new song. See, when you keep going that pretty soon you're going to end up going, well, I'm doing better all along. So by the time my wife gets up, she thinks I'm a morning person. <laughs> it depends on when the morning, in the morning you check me. You've got, you've got to exercise your will. Now, you can't do it by your will. I mean, you can't make yourself godly by your will. But what you can do is you can make, your, you can make yourself a candidate for all those things. You can come to God, and God is willing. When you exercise your will, God is willing. Has anybody in here ever sought God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and God said, whatever, just bug off? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of anybody? The Bible said, Jesus said, God says, if you, thank you, Lord. (coughs) He said, if we will delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desire of our heart. If the desire of your heart is to love God and to walk with him in a beauty of holiness, you think God won't give it to you? God will give it to you. What I'm saying to you today is exercise your will. God will do his part. You can count on that, but God is going to wait for you to do your part, to seek him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Here's the here's verse. Now, you don't have to find it. It's in Romans 8, 29. It says this, that our daily walk, it talks about that. It, 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 can, it, it talks about our walk with God. It refers to it with this phrase, being conformed to the image of his son. Be being conformed to the image of his son. That's what, that's what walking with Jesus is. That's what, that's what walking with Jesus does. When I was growing up, I had a young man that moved in uh, and stayed with the family next to us for the whole summer. And he was from Kentucky, someplace way down in the hills of Kentucky. And he spoke like a Kentuckian. And I liked him, and I stayed with him, and he was my buddy all year. And now people say, why do you talk like you're from the South? I'm not sure, but I think it's because I hung around that guy when I was a little guy. I don't know. I have no other excuse for sounding this way. You know you're going to become like who you hang around. Does anybody know that? Okay. You got kids, right? Some of you. You remember how that was growing up? They start hanging out with yahoos. Your kid's going to be a yahoo. If you don't do something, if he hangs with yahoos, there's just going to be one more yahoo. And that's why it's important, isn't it? Why do you come to church? Because you want to hang around. I was talking to somebody tonight in the fellowship hall. He said, I love fellowship with God's people. Why? Because it's like getting fellowship with God himself. Iron sharpens iron. When I'm with you, some of you, some, somebody told me a story just a while ago. It stirred my heart. It stirred my heart. How God did a miracle in their life. How they sought God and sought God with all their heart. And God gave them a miracle. And God's changed their life and transformed their whole life from that one point. Listen. You get around people like that. You hear stories like that. God's going God's to gonna fire you up. It's just the way it is. And if you get around people that are lukewarm, people don't love God, people don't believe the Bible, or they do but they don't believe it's all true, do you know what a slippery slope that is? If you start cutting out part of the Bible and then I stuck, Cut, start cutting out part of the Bible. We hang around church and they're cutting out part of the Bible. You know what you got? You got, it's worse than nothing. You got idolatry. Did you know that? When I, when I, when I was a young Christian, I used to read the Bible and I would think, my God, people kept going back to idolatry. I thought, how stupid can you be? I mean, I've been stupid in my life, but I've never been that stupid. To take a piece of wood and carve that thing out and make a goat or a ram or a lamb or a seven-headed lady with, with arms everywhere and snakes coming out of her hair and call that thing God, put it on my mantle, pray that thing is God. I mean, on my dumbest day, I haven't been that dumb. To look at that thing and say, there's God that made me. Oh, God, help me. I mean, what? So why? 
do people turn to idolatry? Have you ever thought of it? That's not the message. It's just a freebie. <laughs> Why do people turn from... What's the, what's the attraction to idolatry? I can tell you. Now that you've asked... The attraction to idolatry is that you can make any religion any old way you want it. You, you like illicit sex? Hey, make it part of your religion. And they have. If you read the scriptures, if you read the notes and you got a study Bible, you know some of those temples were not Holy Ghost temples. They were temples where there were temple prostitutes, sometimes male and female. Uh-huh. It was a part of their religion. People, I've heard people say, well, praise the Lord. At least they're going to church. It doesn't matter where they go to church as long as they, they go to church. That's a lie. If you go to a church, and, 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 and I know you don't, so, so, so you'll be happy that you're, you're here. But if, if you go to a place and they don't believe, they don't believe that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. They don't believe in divine healing. They don't believe in salvation. They don't believe the blood. In fact, they've gone through their book and got all that nasty blood out of their book. What do you got? You got idolatry. And the, and the problem is idolatry works, but for a little while. Idolatry works until they say you've got two weeks to live. Idolatry works until they say we've just taken your son to, to be incarcerated. Idolatry works until your mama's on her deathbed and she doesn't know Jesus yet. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, it says this, at some time every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. The tragedy is that for some people it's going to be too late. Everybody's going to, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. But for some it's going to be too late. You see, listen, we got to believe the blood, the book, and the blessed hope. Amen. We cannot back up, slack up, or crack up. we got to hang on. If it's true 2,000 years ago, it's true today. If it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's wrong today. And I don't care what's modern and hip, and, and, and I don't care. If it's right, then it's right now. If it's wrong, then it's still wrong. And here's, here's, here's the bottom line for us, because we're trying to follow God, right? Here's the bottom line for us. If we allow that pollution in our life, you know what? God's going to look at you and God's going to say, what have you done? I've called you to walk with me in the beauty of holiness. I've given you my son. His precious blood is available to cover the sin that you'll put under the blood. But you've chosen to step outside of that and walk in ungodliness. One of these days, you're going to say, Lord, Lord. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You were a worker of iniquity. We have got to cling to God. We've got to cling to righteousness. We've got to look to God. Well, I've got to get on with it here. Isaiah 30, chapter 30, verse 15, is a gift of God to me. I bet you, I, bet, I don't think there's one person in here can quote that, can you, unless he's got it up there. And if he does, well, then you got it. Here's what it says in my Bible. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, He has said, In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Let me tell you something. When your heart is right with God, you've got peace and joy and rest. And I don't care what happens around you, you're going to be steady, you're going to be solid, and you're going to be secure. If God shows you there's some part of you that has, that has not been what it should have been, then you're going to repent. You're going to say, I'm sorry, because if you don't, that's going to destroy your peace. But if you do, it's going to secure your peace. Christians are the most stable, solid people in the world. One of these days, all, about everything is going to come unglued. I think I'm going to see it. And when it comes unglued, people are going to be unglued and they're going to be undone. But if you're not unglued and you're not undone, people are going to come to you. The Bible says the time will come when ten people will come to you to grab hold of the garment and say, tell us about God. 
This is the time when we become revived. This is the time when we become strengthened. This is the time when we insist that the purifying power of God flow through our lives so that we be stable and solid, so that our feet are on the rock, so that when things come unglued, I didn't say if, so when things come unglued, We will be stable by the power of God. And men and women, boys and girls will say, I don't know what you've got, but I've got to find it. Let me back off a little bit. I preach, I get intense, but I'm going to back off a little bit and give you all a break a second and tell you a little story. When I got saved, God made me new. I mean new. In seven days, he took me off tobacco and alcohol and marijuana, and he changed my speech, which was terrible nasty. He changed it all. I went to work where I worked, and I walked in the back door, and it was a great big place. It was a warehouse, and my boss was way over there like by that clock. And when I walked in the door, I wasn't wanting to witness to anybody. I wasn't wanting to say anything to anybody because I'm just hoping I could sneak in and sneak out. But because I'm a new creature and because I've got a new heart, now I guess i got a new countenance because my boss all the way across the warehouse said, Mike, what's happened to you? Across the whole warehouse, he said, Mike, what's happened to you? And he came over to me. I'm saying, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. And he said, he said, Mike, he said, brother, what's happened to you? And I said, well, there's a lot happened to me. And when we get a chance, I'll talk. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, I got time right now. I want to know what's happened to you. I said, Mark, there's a lot. And it could take a long time to tell him we get a chance. I'll tell you, he said, I got time. And he took me by the arm. He took me over between the skids. He said, what has happened to you? I did not say one word. I did not raise my hand in praise. I did not have a Christian t-shirt. I just had a new countenance. And he pulled me over between the skids. And he said, I want to know. We're not leaving until you tell me what's happened to you. I said, Mark, I don't know if you're going to understand or not. See, Mark and I had been drinking buddies and running buddies and other buddies. And now something's different with this old buddy and he's got to know why. And I began to tell him, I said, Mark, I was in church and the preacher preached first time and he preached on hypocrites in the church and I thought it was a pretty good message. And then he said, I don't know how many of you are going to understand this. I got another message to preach. And I looked at my watch and we've been there an hour and 10 minutes. And I said, I didn't understand either. And then he started preaching on Good Friday, what it was really like. And all of a sudden, God became so real to me. It was like I was there Good Friday hurling abuse at Jesus. I could see myself in the crowd hurling abuse and shaking my fist at Jesus. And my heart just broke. And I I said, Mark, then I, and then, then, then I felt like somebody was tapping me, was pushing me in the middle of my back. And I turned around the guy behind me to tell me, leave me alone. I know I'm lost. Leave me alone. But he was praying. I thought, dude, how do you do that so fast? And so he, they kept preaching and they kept doing And I kept feeling that I'd been in the back of my, in, my, in my back like that. And so I turned around two other times to tell him to leave me alone. And he was praying all the time. And I, then I finally realized that he's not the one putting his finger in my back. And so I got up and I came to the altar. It's about as far as from you to here. And by the time I got to the altar, I was broken. I was weeping. And I told him, and Mark's just listening to me. He's just, he's, you know what he's listening to. After that, they watched me. After that, the word went out through all the places that the mad dog got saved. That's what they used to call me, the mad dog. Because if it was something stupid and nobody else would do it, I'd do it. That's what they call me. And now when the mad dog is not the mad dog anymore, people are looking and they're watching. Later on, I got fired. When I got fired, it was not for for unrighteousness I got fired. It was for righteousness I got fired. And the people in the plant, when I would go in the plant, they would come to me and say, oh, isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? I tell you, I'm going to go in. I'm going to tell the boss this and that. And I would say to them, no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. God's at work. I, thanks for thinking of me, but it's really okay. And I would walk over to somebody else, and somebody else said, Mike, I heard about him to you. I'm about to spit nails. I'm going to say. I said, no, no, no. It's okay. I said, God is at work. 
God's going to do something. It's okay. Please don't go and fuss at anybody. It's okay. And I had a chance all over the plant to talk to people. I had a chance to talk to office people and people in the manufacturing part and people that drive the fork trucks, people all over because God really does work all things together for good. But it doesn't happen until you submit to God and say, God, I want you more than my necessary breath. God wants us to be new creatures. He wants us to walk and talk and live and breathe like new creatures. I'm going to share something with you that maybe takes you back. So don't, don't, don't leave me when I say this to you. Please don't let your priority be the fact that you want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Don't let, please, don't let your priority be that you are led by the Holy Spirit. And you say, brother, you've been speaking about that all week. Now you're telling us don't let that be the priority. I, I'm saying don't let that be the priority. The priority should be this. Here's my life verse, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then these other things will be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And when you say all these things, what are all these things? It's all these things. Blessings, yes. P- food, clothing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But God's desire to use you will come as a byproduct. It's not the primary source of things. Your spirituality is not determined on how God has used you or has not used you in the last hour or day or two days. Your spirituality and and the quality of your walk with Christ is based upon have you been seeking Him first? Have you been honoring Him first? If you'll do that, God will give you word when you need word. And I've been talking to you about hearing his voice and knowing his voice and following him. And I've been talking to you about walking past the door of death when he, when he puts something on your heart and you're going, whoa, how's that going to be? And you just swallow it and you say, okay, I'm, by faith I'm going to step through that door of my own understanding which is really standing like an enemy between me and obeying you. I'm going to step right over that thing. Those things will be given to you as byproducts. Seek God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And then, in the process, God will speak to you. And God will use you. And God will direct you by the Holy Ghost. And God will use you to be as poor, a part of somebody else's salvation. God will use you wherever you go to strengthen people. Listen, when you go in with the light of Jesus on your face, somebody's going to get help. Before you even say anything, somebody's going to get help. And God will work with you. God will direct you. God will lead you mostly when you do not expect it. I'm at the end, nearing the end part of the message. This is where we get down and, and I get down with you and say this is what it looks like when you put it in shoe leather. When you love him with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, it doesn't matter to you whether he uses you this minute or not. What matters is that he receives your love and he receives your praise and he receives your adoration. That's what matters. And then if he's got a job for you to do, great. But the most important thing is that you're loving him and you're honoring him and you're serving him. What do you do while you're waiting? Well, now this could be a whole series and I don't have time. You're reading your Bible. When you don't know what to do, read your Bible. Most of the time when God speaks to me, and most of the time I think when he speaks to you, will be when you're reading his word. Imagine that you come to your mom and your mom's made you a great meal. And you say, Mom, I'm not hungry now. And mom says, well, okay. And you come back in two hours and you say, Mom, make me a grilled cheese and 
Mom says, hey, <laughs> I just had a big meal and you didn't want it. Now you want me to come back and do something special for you? Why didn't you take care of it when I had it all laid out for you? And I think God does the same thing. You wait till you get in trouble and then you want to answer from God. And God says, I had my word there for you every day and you wouldn't come. You've grown weak because you're not filling yourself with the word of God and I've had it for you and I would have spoken to you and now you need the Holy Spirit to do something and you're calling pastor, pray for me, I'm in trouble, I'm in a ditch and whatever. You didn't have to be there if you had eaten regularly. So eat, devour that precious divine word of God. Praise and adore him in prayer. Talk to him and thank him and review what he's already done with you. You won't believe how you're strengthened and empowered. Pray, but let your prayers be in everything giving thanks so that you're continually giving thanks and giving praise. If, you're, if your prayers are, oh, God, do this. Oh, God, do this. Oh, God, help me this. Oh, God, help Billy. Oh, God, help Freddie. Oh, God, help God's up there going, golly. But if you're saying, God, I love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, in a moment he may touch you to pray for somebody, and in a moment, in a second, he'll do for that person more than, oh, God, help, oh, God, help, oh, God, help. You could have done that for days. Let me give you an example. My youngest son, my, my, my eldest son, when he was a little boy, we, we were walking around our circle, and and and... And we were thanking God and we were praising God. And I was trying to encourage him. He's quiet. He's still that way. And I was trying to encourage him to be more vocal in it. And all of a sudden, Michael said to me, he was about seven, eight years old. Michael said to me, he said, oh, dad, oh, dad. I said, what is it, son? He said, what's happening to me? He said, I'm hurting right here, dad. What is it, dad? And of course, if he'd have been 65, I'd say, you might be having a heart attack. But he's a little bitty kid. I said, Lord, what is it? And I felt like he was, that God was giving him a burden. You say, what's a burden? A burden is what, when it's heavy on God and he lets it be heavy on you for a minute. That's what a burden is. And so he, and he, I said, he, he said, Dad, what is a burden? I said, God wants you to pray for something. It's really important to him. It's really on his heart. He says, Dad, what do I pray for? I said, I don't know. I don't have the burden. You do. He said, Dad, what do I do? I said, here's what you do. When you got a burden, when you're down and you don't know why, you just give, begin to give God praise. Begin to give God thanks. And in the middle of it, God may open a window and give you a chance to pray. And so, and so I said, so I looked up and my spiritual mother had her, had her light on. And I said, oh, Lord, thank you for Grandma Helen. She might even be praying for us. And I said, son, you go. And I couldn't get him to say anything. And so I said, God, I want to thank you for the stars and the moon, the wonderful things you did. I said, now, son, you go. I couldn't get him to say anything. He's just caught in a hurt. And so finally, finally, he just, he kind of said, Lord, thank you for something. I mean, it's, it wasn't his whole heart, but it was a start. And so I thank God. I said, you thank God. I thank God and you thank God. I said, I thank God and you thank God. We're getting a little better. All of a sudden, I mean, the Holy Ghost hit him. He started thanking God. He was praying like a sewing machine. I couldn't get a word in it edgewise. I mean, he's thanking God for this, thanking God for this, thanking God for this. I mean, the joy of the Lord's on him. He's just thanking God, thanking God. And then all of a sudden, he stops and he says, Jesus, help Walter. And suddenly it's gone. And I said, son, you know what you did? You prayed that God would help Walter. Son, it does, it's, that's gone, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, son, God loves you so much, he lets you be a part of his kingdom. He's going to help Walter. So we go to church the next service. We're sitting in a circle because there's only about 25 of us. And, and we're praying. And when the prayer is done... I, I open my eyes, and a seat next to me is vacant. Our spiritual leader was sitting there a minute ago, and I opened my eyes, and she's not there. And the first thing I thought, you know what I'm thinking, right? Because some of you are laughing. I thought, oh, God, the rapture came and took her, and I'm left, you know. And, and I looked, and guess what? One other seat was empty, the seat that Walter had been in. And now, over in the corner... Here's Grandma Helen kneeling down with little Walter, and little Walter is giving his heart to Jesus. The kingdom of God comes at times when you don't expect it. 
And it comes at times when you can't understand it. And when you can't understand it, when you don't know what's going on, if you'll praise God and thank Him and give Him a great big place that He can come down and send help, God will do amazing and a mighty, mighty wonderful things. There's three stories I want to share with you tonight before we go. God oftentimes, for me, most of the time, when God speaks to me, it's at a time when I am not expecting it at all. Years ago, we, our, food, our family had a little food business. And we had been carrying it, taking a grill. We had a 12-foot charcoal grill. And we drug it behind the minivan. And we had a little thing, a little stand, an awning we put up. And we got out tables. And we had to unload a freezer. And it was so much trouble to set up and so much trouble to tear down. And I began to ask God, God, someday will you give us a trailer we can just pull and set up? And, and so one day I thought I was just doodling. And I had some graph paper. I don't know why I had it, but I did. And I started drawing out if I could, what I would build. And so I had a 24-foot, which was, I think, uh, 24 little blocks. And I, and I just drew it out, and I'm just thinking what would work. And, you know, I'm just, I don't really know that I'm doing a spiritual thing. I'm just doodling, filling time. I put it down next to, in the stack next to my old orange uh, recliner, and uh, I, in with a bunch of papers, and, and time went by. One morning, I'm sitting down in my, in my chair, and I'm reading, and I'm praying, and the Holy Spirit impresses me, speaks to me, gives me the impression in my heart, however you want to say it, God gives me the realization of these words, it's time to start. I was shocked. I said, Jesus, I understand it's time to start, but what I don't understand is what it's time to start. And the Holy Spirit worked with me about that plan, that concession trailer. I said, oh, Lord, I don't have any idea where that plan is. That was so long ago. And the Lord put in my heart that it was in those papers. So, I mean, a bunch of papers. And I got down and within seconds. I had that plan on that piece of graph paper. And I said to the Lord, oh, Lord, what I put down here, I said, that would, even if I did all the work myself, I said, God, that would cost $10,000. I said, God, I don't have $10,000, but Lord, you help me and I'll start. Not too long later, the telephone rang, and it was the bank. Now, we've run our business on a home line loan. If there's any business people in here, farmers in here maybe, you know what I'm talking about. When you need cash and you don't have cash, but your house has value, they'll loan you money on the value of your home. And every year, that's how we did our business. We, that was how we did it. We borrowed it, paid it back at the end of the year, borrowed it, paid it back. The bank called me. And he said, Mike, we've been looking over your, been looking over your, your, your situation for this coming year, and we think we can make a change. And I said, really, what? And he said, well, you know, we think we can give you $10,000 more this year. I said, oh, geez. I'm thinking, am I go back and I go, oh, Lord, $10,000. And I just said it was going to take $10,000. Now the bank says they're going to give me $10,000. I'm so thankful. I'm so excited. So I get out a book. It's a catalog. And I've had it a while. And you can get things cheap. New restaurant equipment cheap. And so I make a list of all the things that I want. I need a Vulcan deep fryer, the kind that has the thermostat that doesn't have to have electricity. And I need a 36-inch gas grill. And I've got all this list all down. And as soon as I know that I've got the money, I call a 1-800 number, and I'm talking to the lady on the phone. I said, ma'am, this is Mike Douglas. I've called out a catalog, such and such. My credit card number is such and such. I'm about to place an order. And she said, okay, go ahead. I said, I need one, a B-1356. And she said, that's a 36-inch gas grill. Is that right? I said, that's right. I go all the way down the whole list, and the last thing on my list is a four-foot sink. I've got everything down, and I start to tell her the number of the four-foot sink, and the Holy Spirit says, no. I said, Lord, no. I got her on the phone. 
and they're going to ship, and this is all going to come at one time. I can't build a trailer without this. And the, and the, and the lady says, sir? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, is there anything else? And I said, uh, no, ma'am. Okay, your order comes to blah, blah, blah. And I hang up the phone, and I said, oh, God, what are you doing? I mean, this is like a chain without a link in the middle. Everything has to fit. Everything has to be connected. You don't have to know the heights of the drains and all this to work. And I can't do it without this thing. And so I'm saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. And so I just, okay. The next Sunday, the Gideons call me. They want me to go speak in a church in Oakland City. So it's about 30 miles. I go to the church. I dress up nice like this. At the end of the church service, I'm coming home. The youth group is already at my house, and they're playing volleyball and everything, and I'm trying to get home. And as I'm coming home, I cross the railroad tracks, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Your sink is back here behind this flop house. It was a nasty place. You'd never want to live there. If they rent rooms, not by the hour, but by the day or something. I mean, you, I promise you, you would not want to live there. Right by the railroad tracks. Need I say more? I, I take the thing and I hit the van and I, and I kind of slide. I get down in there and there's a building. The way the building is built, <coughs> excuse me, there's an L in it. And inside this L, there's horse weeds. Do you guys have horse weeds down here? They're just big old nasty weeds. And... There's broken beer bottles and whiskey bottles and wine bottles, and all kinds of yuck and trash and stuff. And the Lord works with me that that's my, that's my sink. And I'm thinking, what? And I get out my suit and I'm looking around and I see a leg. I see a stainless steel leg. I said, oh, God. And I got in there and I got it like that and I started pulling backwards like that. And I'm pulling it through the beer bottles and I'm pulling it through the horse weeds. And I look out and all four legs are still on it. I get it out and it's stainless steel. Stainless steel can be in a manure pile. It's not going to hurt it. And I look and it's still got the fixtures on it. I'm going, oh, God. And I look at it. It's a four-foot sink. It's exactly what I was going to order. $430 catalog price. And here it is. And God tells me, it's my sink. Then it dawns on me, now what? <laughs> I mean, it's my sink, but I can't take it. What if somebody says to me, God gave me this sink. That's why I'm taking it. <laughs> so I said, Lord, what did I do? So I tried to stuff it back. I couldn't get it back. I stuffed it back as best I could. I'm so excited. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I see and so I get home, and now I'm just wound up like a three-day clock. And I pull up the driveway, and I get out, and I'm hollering, Kids, 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 come here. I said, I got something I want to tell you. And he said, What? I said, blah, blah. I told him a story I already told you. And, and I said, God told me my sink's back here. And I turned, and there it was, and I pulled it out. And I said, Oh, isn't it wonderful? And the kids are going, Yeah. People don't get as excited about God as you do. You got to get used to that. You get you, God works with you. You're so pumped, and they're looking at you like a calf looks at a new gate. You know, kind of uh. Oh. And so you got to work with them, okay? And so I'm pumping these kids. I said, do you understand what this is? Do you understand what happened? And I said, I said to the kids, I said, now I don't know where I'm gonna. I mean, I don't know who owns these apartments. And we got a girl who who is a foster child. And this girl said, I know who owns those apartments. Charlie Bob does. And I said, Charlie Bob? I said, well, I don't know who his phone number is. She said, it's 724, blah, blah, blah. I said, honey, how do you know that Charlie Bob owns those apartments? And how do you know his phone number? And she said, that's where, when I was with my mom, that's where we lived. And I had to call him sometimes. My heart's just breaking. This is Sunday. And now I'm still filled with the glory of God, but I'm thinking, God, Sam, Evangelist Sam, I later would call her because God got a hold of her, and she told everybody everywhere she went about Jesus. I said, God, you tell me, Sam lived in that place? My heart was broken. The next morning I got up. She told me that he owned Charlie Bob's Tavern. So I waited until about 9 o'clock. I called Charlie Bob's Tavern, and I finally got Charlie Bob on the phone. And I said, I said, you don't know me, but 
my name is Mike Douglas, and I said, you've got a sink out behind uh, some property down here. He said, yeah, I know I do. And I said, well, would you ever consider selling? And he said, yeah, yeah, I think I'd sell it. I said, what would you take for it? He said, well, I don't know, what would you give? I said, well, what would you take? <laughs> See, I know what it is new. It's $430. Don't tell Charlie Bob. I said, okay, Charlie Bob, I tell you what, you tell me what you'd take. He said, I, I don't know, what would you give? Third time, what would you give? I said, uh, $25 or $20. He said, $20. I mean, he just went nuts. $20, that's a stainless steel sink, blah, 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 $20. I couldn't take, what are you doing saying to me, 20 There ain't no way I can take $20. I said, okay, what would you take? He said, well, I'd have to have uh, 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 25 I said, I'm coming over here right now. And I give him a little minivan. I give him a little five by a trailer. I go over and I pay him $25. I'm as happy as a lark, buddy. I pull over and I get that old thing and get it out of the horse weeds and the beer bottles and the wine bottles and, and get it all shoved off best I can. Flip that thing over, get it in the trailer. Man, I'm going home. I'm happy. God lets me build a trailer. And there's lots of stories I could tell you. But I'm going to jump way down the road, years down the road. Later, I'm in a jail. I'm in a jail ministry, and there's some women in the jail ministry. There's four of them, and they got him in one room, and a guard said, do you want to go talk to them? And I said, oh, yeah. Now, I know that I'm going to be on camera all the time, and I know I'm going to be on audio all the time, and I'm praying, God, help me, help me. And when I get in there with these four ladies, I mean, they, they, they're pretty rough looking. And I get in there with them, and I'm saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And God put it on my heart, and I started sharing with them that hey, it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter what you've done. The God who created you loves you, and He wants that you can come and be washed clean and walk with Him. And I start telling them. And then God puts it in my heart to tell them this story that I've told you. Well, I haven't told that story in years to anybody. And now God puts it on my heart to tell these ladies. And so I'm saying, listen, I said, God can work with you. God can speak to you. God can work in a powerful and wonderful way. I said, let me tell you a story. So I started telling a story just like I told you. Only this time, one of the ladies is going. And then she says, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I'm looking at her thinking, what's she doing? I mean, she's sabotaging this, or what's she doing? And finally, after I've told this story, I turned to her and I said, ma'am, i got to ask you something. All the time I've been telling this story, you've been sitting there going, that's right. Yes, that's right. I said, how could you possibly know the story I've just told is true? She said, do you remember when you called Charlie Bobbs that morning? I said, well, yeah, I think I do. She said, do you remember that the person answered the phone was a woman? I said, come to think of it. She said, I was that woman. And she said, I stood there while Charlie Bob was talking to you and all of a sudden, Charlie Bob got so aggravated, and he hung up. And Charlie Bob, the owner of Charlie Bob's Tavern, started saying, God must have had me do that. God must have had me do that. And she said, what? She said, I can't believe I sold that sink for $25. God must have had me do that. <laughs> now, have you followed what I'm saying here? The plan, though it existed long ago, God knew when it was time to start. God sent the banker on the phone to say, we'll give you the money that you need, even though they didn't have any idea what I'd do with it. God gave the list of what we needed, and he allowed me to order everything I was going to have to order. And when he got to the one thing that he was going to provide another way, he stopped me. 
because he stopped me and because I obeyed and was speaking someplace else when I came to the railroad tracks and he said, you're sink, it's behind here. Because you see what I'm saying? With, without any one of these things happening, the story never would have come to completion. And the greatest part of the story is not that I got a four-foot sink, $430 value for $25. The greatest thing is that while there's four ladies lost in sin, I've got an irreputable witness among them that says that was God. I know that story is true. I heard that story. And last but not least, of all of the stories, Stories that I could have told them that God would put it on my heart to tell a story I hadn't told and I don't even know when. What I want you to see is not that is not about me, but God. When you respond to God in any way, You won't understand. It won't make sense. But if God is in it, it'll have fingers that go through all eternity. Whatever you do for God doesn't end. The Bible says his word does not return to him void. Whatever God speaks, it has a life that is eternal. And souls can be changed. Lives can be transformed. His kingdom can be done. And his will can be done if, if We've given God a place that he can come and land. If we've determined to walk with God in the integrity of our heart, that we can serve him with clean hands and a pure heart, keeping ourselves receptive through our praise and our worship and our reading and and just loving God, just loving God. In the process of that, God will speak to you. You can count on it. I believe God's already spoken to you, some of you, in the last few days. Has God spoken to you? Has God, I, know, I know you have because people have been coming to me. Listen to me. Listen to the voice of God. Let God use you. Let God speak through you. And if you do, God's kingdom can come and God's will can be done in your life. And lastly, I want to share with this, share this with you. Don't be afraid of coming to the end of yourself. Don't fear when all of your options dry up and there's nobody to re- there's nobody to count on but God. I'm a pastor now, but I've only been a short time, about 14 and a half years. Through the darkest time of my life in 98, we went through a time when I thought we were going to go bankrupt. I thought we were going to lose our house. God worked with me that we couldn't go back into the jail ministry anymore, and I had to resign. And God worked with me that we weren't going to have a part in the youth ministry anymore. It was the darkest, most hurtful, most empty time of my whole life. I thought maybe I'd done something, and I grieved God so badly that he had washed his hands of me or something. And in the darkest time of my life, God spoke to me in the inner man and said, get set up like a commercial cabinet builder. I thought, what? I don't know if I'm going to have a house. I don't know if I'm going to have a garage. I don't know if I'm going to have anything, Lord. I said, Lord, I hear you, but you're going to have to do it. In no time, the church had two deacons. I was one of them. The other deacon came to me and said, Brother Mike, I've just wondered, would you ever have use for a a table saw? I said, what? Why are you saying this to me? He said, would you ever have use for a table saw? I said, yeah, but I I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do with it now, but I don't even have a place to put it. You'd have to keep it. And he said, it's okay. I'll keep it for you a little while. And I thought, dear God, you put it on my heart to get set up like a cabinet builder, and I didn't have anything, and now you provided a table saw. Before long, we went to Evansville to my mother's house, and we're with my family, and my brother comes to me. Out of the blue, he says to me, Mike, Would you ever have use for a radial arm saw? 
I said, why are you saying this to me? He said, well, I bought one. I put vinyl siding on for people. And I realized the guys that do it don't cut it with a radial arm saw. And well, I just thought of you. And before I knew it, God in his sovereignty had, had given us a shop and filled it and fulfilled and called me to the ministry and called me to build a church and equipped us to do it. As I leave you in the last seconds, let me tell you in the clearest way I know how. God has a will, he has a purpose and a plan for you. And it won't seem right even if he told you, you'd go, what? But if you can follow him moment by moment, step by step, keeping your heart clear with him, loving him, worshiping him, praising him, honoring, adoring him, and letting him lead you when he chooses to lead you. Don't force it. If you try to force it, you'll get yourself in a mess. People get crazy. Oh, God, should I wear the red dress, blue dress, red dress, blue dress, red dress, blue. God's up there going, just get dressed. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? God knows when to speak to you. You live in righteousness and praise and peace and joy and let God choose what and when and what he says. And if you do that and if you follow, let me tell you, my friends, you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory today, tomorrow, and every day until Jesus comes again. Amen? Amen. Amen.